right from an early age, I knew I was different. I was different to the other children. When I started school, I realised that I didn't interact with the world in the same, the other, same way the other children did. Teachers kept correcting my behaviour. As I grew older and older and older, I realised I wasn't born into a world that was designed by people like me for people like me. Throughout my life, I've had to overcome challenges just because I was born differently. See, as a left-handed person, the world has been designed by right-handed people. I've had to adapt in sport, using a pair of scissors, even tightening and untightening screws. And for me, when someone says turn left, that's not a 50-50 guess. It takes me about 15 seconds to process that in my head. Which is the hand I write with, which is the hand I don't write with. Oh, this must be that, it must be left, that must be that way. And still I get it wrong. I'm also a Saturday child. So if you know the rhyme, a Saturday child works hard for a living. And I'm a Capricorn. So I'm a left-handed Saturday child Capricorn. And that's part of my identity, part of who I am. And we all have something that makes us unique. I'm sure in the audience we have a Wednesday child who's a Taurus who's right-handed. I often say that, someone goes, how did you know it was me? But randomly. So we all have something about us that makes us unique. So when we think about diversity and inclusion, D and I, how often do we just think about race, ethnicity, LGBTQ+, do we really think about the nuances and differences in the people we're working with and engaging with. When Lisa spoke earlier, she talked about the engagement, about motivation. If we're looking to motivate people the same, we're not going to get the results we desire because people are motivated in different ways. People have different ambitions, different phases of their life. Some people value flexibility. Some people value career and acquisition of titles and status. So let me talk to you today about finding your why of DNI, finding your why of diversity and inclusion, and why it should be relevant to you as individuals. Helps if I push the right button. So what is your why? First of all, it's the human factor. I want to be treated fairly, you want to be treated fairly. And of course we want to treat, we want to, as people people, we believe we should treat people fairly, because that's the right thing to do. But I also maintain there has to be a business case. And sometimes I feel that people are going to hang me up to drive every time we talk about the business case. We shouldn't have to have a business case when we're talking about people. But we also have to recognise different thinking styles. There are some people who love spreadsheets. There are people who love the numbers. So we have to work with both people, the people people, and also the people that control the budgets. And what I say is we can achieve both through similar strategies. So we don't have to preclude the people experience or preclude the business benefits. Because when they go hand in hand, that's where we get the return. That's where we get the real engagement and organisations can move forward. So it's not only do we have to think about the business why, you think about your own personal why. Why does it matter to you as an individual to be inclusive, as well as the business? How often do we just have conversations with people like us? Who we choose to have lunch with? Who we choose to stand in the queue next to? When we get on a train, we scan the carriage. Where are we going to sit? We often homogenise and hang out with people like us. This affinity bias, yeah, PLU, PLM, people like me, people like us. Because it's so much easier to talk to people who are like you, isn't it? So we've got to make sure 
that we're not just listening to people like us, we've got to listen to all voices. So ask yourself the question, who isn't represented around the table? Who aren't we hearing from? How can we create space to bring in new ideas? Because one of the powers of diversity is having more ideas in the room. Have you ever heard of this acronym, FRIDA? FRIDA, the principles underpin most human rights legislation. It certainly underpins the Equality Act, human, European human rights. And most countries who have legislation, this underpins it. So FRIDA stands for fairness, respect, equality or equity, dignity and autonomy. Who remembers the wheelchair user who landed at an airport and his wheelchair wasn't made available at the terminal. They offered to push him through the terminal because his self-propelled chair wasn't available. You remember that incident? This person would rather, and he actually did, crawl through the terminal and drag himself through it using his hands. Because by being pushed in a wheelchair, took away his dignity. It also took away his autonomy. So this person felt disabled by the fact they didn't have their chair. And I'm hoping there's a lot of lessons learned there. But what we've got to focus on here is actually talking to the people who need the equity, people who need the support to perform and function within society. So, maybe, so when you're thinking about people, when you think about decisions, when you think about engaging, ask yourself, am I being fair? Am I being respectful of that person? Am I genuinely giving them the tools to succeed? And of course, am I treating them with dignity and giving them that autonomy, that freedom of choice? As Lisa said earlier, autonomy is very important when we talk about motivation, getting engagement. Depends on getting interactive, got your phones handy. Hopefully at the back there, you can still scan that in, so if you can. If you can't scan it, um, it's ahaslides.com forward slash I am Inc. I am Inc, if you want to do it that way. Okay, we've got it. Give you another couple of seconds. So there's, I've got a few questions for you, just to phone a friend and ask the audience. Here we go, there's a bigger version there. Anybody still? No, it looks like you're all in. Okay, here we go. So I am diverse and inclusive, aren't I? Each question is 30 seconds, it's timed, so we're not spending the day here. It's a bit of fun, it's all anonymous. Okay, no prizes on the so question one, what do you see as the main barrier to being a more diverse and inclusive organisation? Is it lack of awareness, cost change, knowing where to start, finding resources to help, or it's just not a priority for you? So what do you reckon? Rate those in terms of importance. Okay, so the the clear winner there, oh, still coming through, where are we? Clear winner is lack of awareness, which is interesting. Normally when I ask this question, um, not knowing where to start, it comes out quite high. So what have you said not, not knowing where to start? That was your second highest, so not knowing where to start. So lack of awareness, not knowing where to start. Especially when we talk about it, some of the initiatives we're talking about today. Cost of change is low, so it's not cost. Finding resources and not a priority. So fortunately, you're not saying it's not a priority. You're not saying it's cost. You're saying lack of awareness, knowing where to start, and finding some resources to help. Okay, we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Okay, next. What do you feel will have the greatest impact to develop your thinking? Is it more awareness? Your customer demand. 
Are your customers demanding? Reacting to problems? Training or societal pressure? Yeah, waiting for the final results to come in. Okay, looks like training of four, blue, more awareness. So more awareness and training. And I agree. We're spending, we are spending millions and millions of pounds, euros, dollars globally on unconscious bias training. But the statistics are showing that that training alone doesn't move the needle, doesn't bring real change. So we've got to think about the training we're doing. Reacting to problems. Fortunately, you're not dealing with discrimination cases, law, etc., etc. So that's, that's good. Societal pressure. I think this is important. If we look around the world, we're talking about climate change, talking about plastics, talking about sustainability. We're also talking about Black Lives Matter. We're talking about neurodiversity. We're talking about violence against women and girls. We're talking about LGBT rights and issues. So all of these factors are, being, are very contemporary and they are important to people in society and in the world in general. So I think societal pressure is, I don't want like to say forcing companies, but at least pushing this onto the corporate agenda so people are now more hyper-focused. I do a lot of work in the talent acquisition space with recruiters. And what they're seeing is that when they're doing tenders for corporates, 20% of the tender has a D&I component. So they're having to actually show their own companies D&I credentials as part of a tender process. So we're going to see this push down more and more. It used to be BS 5750, ISO 9001. There was 27,001, 15,001. And now we're looking at diversity, inclusion, and sustainability as being core to people's thoughts. So why should we think in a more diverse and inclusive way? It's the right thing to do makes good financial sense. Increased opportunity to find staff. Makes us more relevant to our market. Or well, it's just pressure from customers. What do we think of the, the core drivers in your business? So quite clearly, you know, 5.8. It's the right thing to do. It's still driving most people's decisions. I'd like to think it also makes yeah, increased opportunities to find staff. If we're fishing in the same pool for the same people, what about all the people we're not hiring and we're not recruiting? We're in a global talent shortage at the moment. I'm sure most of you in your businesses are fighting for the best staff. If you're not looking at all people, then you're missing out on a whole sector. Makes us more relevant. You may live in a predominantly white world, not ethnically diverse. If you're not thinking about the, the customers and clients you may have who aren't white, you're missing out on potential opportunities. If your thermos, you know, the, the, uh, the vacuum flask manufacturer, they designed a product for soup. Sounds easy, thermos flask for soup, great. They put a little spoon in the lid, I don't know if you've seen them, they put a little spoon in the lid. I know for a fact the person that designed that was right-handed. I know the person who did the QA testing was right-handed. I know the person that signed off did the marketing was right-handed. Because what happens when a left-handed person uses it? The spoon folds up when you're trying to eat with it. So they've inadvertently excluded 10% of their market just by designing a product that only works for right-handed people. So if you're only designing a product that works for women, that works for men, that works for white people, straight people, you're potentially excluding a large chunk of market. So I'd like to think it will make you more relevant, and give you increased opportunities. This is what we talk about the business benefit as well as the right thing to do. Obviously, pressure for customers. Customer, you, know, you may not think that customers are savvy. I'll talk about your brand in a minute. So key attributes of an effective leader. I mean, Lisa talked earlier about the investment you need in your leadership tier. What do you think the key elements are? Authority, listening, motivating, inclusion, vision, or passion?
So motivating came out really high. Listening, inclusion, vision, authority is way down here. We'd have run this survey 20 or 30 years ago. We valued our leaders to be strong, command and control. This is what we look for. But now we're seeing we want to make sure our leaders have this EQ, are listening and motivating staff in a different way. The focus on these elements. Thank you very much for that. That's a bit of insight to see how you're thinking. I'll give you a PDF of all of these so you can uh, download them later. So when people ask me to define inclusion, my simple definition is how you make me feel by how you treat me. If you treat me in this way, I'm going to feel passionate, motivated, engaged. I'm going to feel alignment with the organization. But apparent. <laughs> I'm going to feel passionate. I'm going to feel engaged with the organization, that sense of belonging the self-actualization where the magic happens. If you treat me in this way, you ignore me, you don't motivate me, you're using banter or jokes about me, microaggressions, all the things. I come into work and go, why do I bother? I'm going to feel excluded. And I say, worse still, I'll feel tolerated. We talk about being a tolerant society. What a horrible word tolerance is. It means I've got to put up with you. I don't like you, but I have to put up with you. I would rather be excluded than tolerated. Death by a thousand cuts to me, the toleration, being tolerated. So how you make me feel by how you treat me, really important. How do we treat our people? Not talk about allyship, taking action. It's about being holistic, active and deliberate. The active and deliberate bit. I don't believe you can be a passive ally. When we look at the, the social injustices in the world, food poverty, etc., what we're talking about here, joblessness, the lack of education, and we look at what's happening to marginalised, oppressed, underrepresented groups. We're not being active about our allyship, active about involving them in our organisation. What are we doing? How many organisations have a recruitment policy where you actually look at who's applying, who's going to the top of the funnel, and then say to yourself, why aren't we getting more black people applying? Why aren't we getting more people with a disability applying? Why are we just getting the usual suspects? Because if you're just saying, well, nobody's interested. Everyone could have applied, no one did. That's passive. It's almost blaming the candidate for not applying. And people say, well, they're hard to reach. What I say is, if people are hard to reach, reach harder. What can you do to be proactively reaching out to the, to, the, to the communities? Employer branding, recruitment marketing, all these aspects. But sometimes you've got to look at yourself in the mirror. What do you look like from the outside? Do you look very white, very traditional? Are you appealing? So look at your own image through a different lens. And if you're not sure, if you've got staff networks, Maybe you can go out to the market, maybe you can talk to people in the community. Say, would you work for us? Or tell us what you think we look like. Maybe what you need to do is adjust your persona and think about how people see you. I'm often asked if I've got a DNI strategy or playbook that someone can download. Just change the names. But the important thing when we talk about diversity and inclusion, any people strategy. It's your people, it's your passion, your mission, your values. So by giving you a downloadable template, it does, it's not going to work. You have to find your own why of D&I and build it on your customers, your customer demands, and how your people are. So think about your brand. And we talk about brand as being how you're perceived in the market. Do you want to be seen as a, an employer, a company that provides products that are inclusive? Or do you want to be seen as an organization that excludes people? So when you think about accessibility, think about your application process, think about the product design, all the aspects. So diversity and inclusion is more than just about how you treat each other. You know, we think about the staff, it often sits in HR. DNI needs to be a thread that runs through your entire business. 
not just HR. Product design, marketing, brand, customer service. So there is no one size fits all. Really, really important that you stay focused on being relevant. Plastic, sustainability, I mentioned earlier. If you're not focusing on this, and that's what your customers demand, you'll soon be going backwards. We've seen Blockbuster, we've seen Mothercare, we've seen BHS, we've seen all these companies that didn't keep focused on what's going on in the world. They weren't having diverse leadership, making decisions. It was the same old crew making the same old decisions. So you've got to invest in the power of diverse leadership. Be inclusive and think about your people. So we think about the, the ROI. We, you know, this is the business benefit, the ROI. Return on inclusion. Client retention, we're relevant. We're not going to turn people away. Increased opportunities for staff. People empowerment and relevance to the market. Because if we're hiring people from different backgrounds with more thoughts, with different thoughts, of course we're going to recognise more opportunities. Of course we're going to recognise gaps in the market. This is the return. Just on empty seat costs, we can, we can justify the, the cost of any inclusion initiative. Think about the hiring cost of, of a new member of staff. When I was speaking to the REC the other week, the Recruitment Employment Council, they reckon it's £135,000 when you make a bad hire mistake. So it, maybe it costs you £25,000, £30,000 to hire somebody. The cost of getting it wrong, the cost of not taking that advantage. Just think what it costs you to have an empty seat, cost of retraining, etc., etc. So if you're losing your people because you're not diverse, you're not inclusive, you're not motivated people, what's that really costing you? So I talk about this positive people experience, or PPE, a bit topical. It is, so it's not just your staff. It's about how you make people feel by how you treat them. That's everybody holistically. So we think about how we can engage with our customers, our stakeholders, in different ways. Again, that creative thought. So inclusive leadership, to me, is the core. It's about investing in your leadership tier. How often do we promote people because they're great technicians? How often do we promote people through time served? We need to spot people with high EQ. We need to spot people for potential and capability, not just because they were good at another job. We also need professional leaders that have time to focus on their staff, not three jobs, technician, quality assurance, oh, and leadership. Because how can you be present in the moment to have those conversations with people who are stressed about other things? So we've got to look after our leaders and make sure we train them. So it's about empowering people. Passion. And Lisa talked all about this in the morning, so I won't go over it again. Communicating. If we're not careful, what happens often is we have this great idea in the boardroom. We do a lot of boardroom thinking, but we don't genuinely communicate it to what's going on. Before we roll out of our program, are we thinking about how it's going to be, be implemented? Do you have a comms team that are going to handle this? And also, if you don't roll it down slowly, if you've trained the people who are the more junior level first, the first question they say is, what's going on? And if the leadership tier doesn't, hasn't bought in, isn't aware of the process, then that message gets diluted. So it's really, really important to think about how you're going to communicate these events. Think of this equation. Event. Plus reaction equals an outcome. I see something, I, I hear something, I have to make a decision on something. I, make a, I react, I make a decision, that leads to an outcome. What we have to recognize here is that the plus is our perspective. How I perceive that event completely impacts how I'm going to react. And therefore, that will lead to a different outcome. 
So I always say there's more than one truth. There's my perspective of the world, there's your perspective of the world, and there's the greater truth. So at least three truths. How often do we get involved in arguments over here at the outcome? You end up disagreeing fundamentally. You know, Brexit remain, Tory Labour, whatever, whatever your fundamental argument is. How often do we talk about perspectives? I believe this because. I'm more interested in finding out your because, your why, your lived experience, your history. I'm far more interested in talking about this. So we don't have to agree, but I can understand your perspective. I can understand why you think something. Now I talk about, there's a, there's a great phrase saying, strong opinions weakly held. So we have our, have our beliefs, and often we hold them so tight. And we spend our entire life trying to prove ourselves right. Confirmation bias. Imagine being able to let go of some of your strong opinions, just to the point where you can test them. So you're looking for information that doesn't fit, you're looking for alternatives. So carve, sorry, etch your views in sand, not carve them in stone. Because when you share other people's perspectives, you might say, to rub that bit out, modify my thinking. And I'm not suggesting for one moment you go down any crazy conspiracy theory routes, but at least be willing to explore different ways of thinking. Listening, again, is very crucial. We have our own experts in our organizations. We don't need to bring people in. We've got staff networks, we've got community groups, we've got loads of ways we can, we can talk. It could be a, a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group. We've got plenty of ways we can listen, but we want, we've got to be willing to adapt and change. So if we're not, we just hold on to our views, dismiss those of others. Privilege is often a, a trigger word for many being accused of having privilege. Privilege, fundamentally, is not what you've been through. It's about what you haven't been through. So I like to think of people who have less privilege have an additional pebble in their rucksack, an extra burden they carry with them. So if you're white, you're straight, you're male, you often don't even think about showing up in the world. I've got friends who are wheelchair users and they think about their journey every day. They think about how they're going to get on the bus, how they're going to get on the train. Will the train stop at the station and let them off or will they be pushed two stops down before they can get off the train? So they're constantly thinking about their disability. I don't think about that as, as an able-bodied person who can walk. So privilege is, to me, it's not about why, it's about why I don't have to go through on a daily basis. So thinking about people's differences. Celebrate them, but recognize you don't have to go through that. So I'm not asking anyone to feel shame about being white. Don't feel shame about being able-bodied or being straight. But recognize that other people need that help and support. Back to equity again, back to Frida, where we started at the beginning. What do you, can you do to give that person that support? actively and deliberately. So if you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. You feel like someone's trying to steal your pie. Hang on a minute, I've got to give something up if, to give these people a chance. But the big news story is there's plenty of pie to go around. No one's going to have yours. It's about putting more chairs around the table, creating a bigger meal not about taking yours away. Language. How we describe people, how we talk to people, affects the way they see themselves, how they're going to perform. Language matters to me. How you describe me, how you talk about me matters. If I'm bombarded with microaggressions, language that makes me feel less than, makes me, language that makes me feel sad, of course I'm not going to perform. So we think about language, the common sayings, phrases. How often do you hear the phrase, ladies and gentlemen? Train announcements, I've heard it here today twice. What about the percentage of the population that I identify as lady or gentleman? 
You've not heard of non-binary people. Maybe you do a bit of research, but they don't identify as either a lady or a gentleman. So we're inadvertently excluding a whole group of people just through the language we choose. So we often root our language in the default, in the privilege. We don't have men's football, do we? But we have women's football. We have to, we have to prefix women's football with women so we know we're talking about women. How often do we talk about things in the default, in the privilege? How hard is it to buy birthday cards and Christmas cards and anniversary cards if you're black? You can't even buy a sticky plaster for your hand that's in skin colour. Flesh-coloured tights, they're not black, are they? So we're describing things in the default. How does that make people feel? Do they feel included or not included? So there are various ways we can think about how the language we use, how we describe something. Despite our good intent, the impact could be negative. This is where we start to be, be accountable. Recognize that what we first thought, our first language, our first action went wrong, became problematic. So therefore, what can we do about it? What's our plan B? What's our recovery plan? That person that turned up at COP26 in a wheelchair, their plan was to go back to the hotel because nobody was able to, to make it work for them to get into that building. So think about how you can create that plan B. So motivation, one size doesn't fit all. Flexibility, remuneration, pay, rations, all these things. Motivation is very individual. Different phases of our lives. We learned one thing in COVID, you know, we talked about same storm, different boats. We started to realize that we had to treat people as individuals. Look at people's mental health needs, financial needs, various aspects of people we'd never have to tackle before. We were now seeing into their lives, into their kitchens, into their sofas. We couldn't just assume everyone was okay anymore. But we were in danger of going backwards. COVID's done, everyone's happy now. They're not. There's still lots of issues that people are facing with mental health, anxiety. People are anxious about getting vaccinated. People are anxious about traveling on trains. People are anxious about being in an office. So how are you working with your people? And the motivation side as well. So we've got to acknowledge the biases we have. And a lot of the biases come from privilege, perspectives, learned behavior, lived experience. We're not thinking about people in that way. Some of the biases are unconscious. We still have more CEOs called John than women in this FTSE 500. And we, we joke about that year on year, and it's still true. So we've got to think about how we can acknowledge our biases and mitigate them. Don't think you can remove bias. You can mitigate through process, and through lots of why questions, start with yourself. Why do I think this? Why do I think that? Then be comfortable. Other people challenging you. That's interesting, Joe. Tell me why you think that. Let's talk about your perspective on that decision. If we can start building that equation into our organizations, we challenge perspectives, not outcomes. We'll be far more progressive in thinking about our individual people and their needs. So think about conscious inclusion, again, active, holistic, and deliberate, consciously including. If I'm making a decision in the hiring process and I see, I don't know, a university on there that I think, oh, well, that's a great university, or they've got a 2-1 or a first, that's the halo bias kicking in. I think, wow, this isn't really good here. Or we see they've got a third, or we see they went to this university. Do we immediately just put them in the pile, say, no, we only hire two ones and above. We don't care who you are, two ones and above. What can you do to challenge that thinking? Challenge that preconception, challenge that perspective that only a person with a two one from this university can possibly be a lawyer at our firm. Or well, they must have worked at a previous firm at this level with this experience. And of course, our biases kick in and say, well, I'm good at my job, so the person I'm looking for must be like me. 
I got hired because I was fantastic and I had all this experience. So again, our biases, our preconceptions of how we see people is based on our own sense of self. So we've got to think about how we can mitigate the biases in the recruitment process. There are products out there that take you through objective-based hiring. Lots of platforms. So the first thing you can do is bin the CV. I know a lot of people talk about anonymizing a CV. Why don't you just bin it completely? And people go, what? Bin the CV? How will I know what they've done? That's exactly the point. It's about hiring for potential, hiring for capability. We want our leaders that we can train with high EQ. We can train skills. We know that an interview and CV is effective for about three months in most organizations. You have the right skills. Because you have to learn your organizational culture. You have to learn your standards, your processes, everything like that. It takes you three months anyway. So everyone's a new person starting at the same point. So these phrases like, I want someone to hit the ground running, laced with bias and perspective about the type of person you're looking for. So how can you try and remove those phrases from your organization? Of course, in performance management, are we rating people objectively? Do people like me, people like us, get higher grades? People are working flexibly, working from home a lot more. Are they seen as slackers or not up to the mark if they're not putting the 15 hours a day in? How do we value people? One moment. <clears throat> the onboarding process, are we giving the same, everyone the same experience? When we're allocating work, are we going to the same people and not bringing people on who may be less experienced? Can we have these challenging conversations? I heard a story recently from a, at a networking event I was at, how someone was underperforming, but their manager was scared to talk to them because the manager was white and the employee was black. They were scared to challenge this employee in case they felt the employee was going to think they were racist. They were scared to be seen as racist. So what they did instead was they just kept ignoring the problem, not willing to have that conversation. Until the point the problem became so big, they had to let this person go. But this came out of the blue because this person wasn't given the chance to have the conversation, to learn. Another person was a graduate, part of a graduate intake. She's black and she was joining with black and female and she was joined with a whole load of other graduates, mainly female. And after about six months, they thought this is a great place to work. But then they found out one of their white colleagues was given a promotion that wasn't advertised, wasn't made available to anybody else, just this one person. So they were picked out of the crowd. So how do you think that made the cohort of graduates, who are quite, quite a few of them are black, feeling this white woman was picked out of that group? So think about how when the people experience we're giving and I'm not here judging whether that person was the right person or the wrong person. But I'm just talking about the process that the people went through wasn't open to scrutiny. So I'd like you to be change makers. If anything I've said today, if anything other presenters have said today, has given you some inspiration. How can you bring that change back into your organization? Otherwise, when you leave here, your brain resets, you get back into traffic mode, into train mode, into feeding someone mode or dealing with somebody mode, and what happens today goes out the window. How can you make a positive difference for your being here? Striving for excellence, you know, if you think about diversity and inclusion, you think about the people experience. How do you have a zero tolerance to bias, exclusion, Etc. Etc. How can you create space as an ally? I don't want people to speak for me. I don't want speak people to interpret my words or speak over me. I want someone to create space that I can stand in and be my own advocate and be amplified, put on a stage where I can talk to people. I can I can talk to you about me quite easily. That's your role as an ally is to amplify people give them positions. 
So allyship programs are really important, and this is not just about, we talk about allyship, we, we, we often jump into thinking LGBTQ, we think about race allies, but allies are also about people. And allies could be mentors, informal mentoring arrangements in organisations. Someone can come to you for help and support to develop their career. But I think most importantly is rooting out toxicity. Again, as Lisa talked about earlier, that, that, that person in the, in, the, uh, in the chart with the ones, that person there is effectively bringing down the entire group, as well as being demotivated, unengaged, they're bringing down the group. So toxicity can spread when people are disgruntled. We know that people become security risks when they're not fully engaged. We know that their error rate goes up when they're not engaged. But we also know that people are less respectful, their banter, their humour. We hire a lot of gifted jerks. Yeah? Why do we tolerate gifted jerks? In certain professions, uh, we get people who are too, too useful to fail. But they bring this toxic culture and everyone just puts up with it and says, oh, they're like that, they're a partner, they're a consultant, they're a big fee earner. But if you're going to change the organisation, there has to be a way of not having these people as managers, as leaders, or in contact with any other human being. <laughs> so think about the toxicity. When you buy fish, you clean the tank before you put the fish in the tank. You hire people and you put them in the same dirty water. Is it no wonder they develop fin rot? So clean the tank, get rid of the toxicity before you bring the new fish in. So my final challenge to you is, are you gonna act? Act, action changes things. I don't know if you've ever watched the video, Inclusion Starts With I by Accenture. If not, find it on YouTube. And the message out there is very clear. Inclusion starts with I, with me, with I. I can't change the world, but I can change the one. I can be the one. And I can bring that positivity to the people around me. So I can influence my network. So if we can get everybody to be the one to bring change, then the message will grow. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions if there's some online or hello internet. Lisa. Um, really me. I want to say all kinds of things that I shouldn't. We're talking about intense stuff. Um, how do you break the habit of one resonating with this? I would say, ladies and gentlemen, no intent behind it, that's my point. Yeah. How do you break the habit? Because sometimes it is just fictional, isn't it? One thing I often say is if you learn something is problematic, you have the choice to do something different. You have the power to do, use different words. So if you learn that sounds problematic, what can you do as a conscious decision never to use that word again or that phrase again? If you, if you learn that something is potentially racist, we can all Google it and get Miriam's Webster dictionary out and say, well, it's not really racist. But some people do find it racist. Then you've got the choice to change. So I would say is bring it into the front of your head. Bring it into the moment and say, wow, thank you. Right, and every time you're going to say it, you go, Got it wrong again, I'm going to get it right next time. Um, I, I say the same about guys, you know, the word guys. Who decided that guys was gender neutral? So it wasn't women. And if you ever try Googling for guys, I, you don't find many women in swimsuits, you find many men in swimsuits. So some people find it problematic. I've seen big debates on LinkedIn where some people say, well, guys, I don't mind guys. But that's fine. The people that do, we've got to think about the needs of them. And I know we have colloquialisms from where you come in the country that some people are hens, some people are duck, some people are love, which is great. But when someone's coming from the outside, do they get it? Do they understand it? How does that make them feel? One word I detest is mate. Ugh. Maybe it's because I'm trans. Maybe I've got this inbuilt ugh, hate of that word when someone calls me mate. But it happens all the time. Do I look like your mate? Really? So think about those words. 
and the impact they may have on someone, if not this person. So if, if you're with people you know, and you call each other love, duck, hen, hun, whatever you want to call each other, that's fine. But how do you make people feel included in the group when they're from the outside? Are you a, are you a bit clicky? Are you a bit of an in-crowd? How do people break into that? So how do you welcome? How do you make me feel when you treat me in that way? So does that answer the question? Yeah. Kath, you must have a question. Thank you, highlight makes you up. I really appreciate it. <laughs> That's a good question back, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs> Inspiring stories. Um, I work a lot with talent acquisition companies, uh, recruiters. I work a lot with internal and agency. Uh, I work with a lot of housing associations. And, I, and I've worked for, I also work with a large uh, multinational gaming company. I look at some of the work they're doing, and they're being very proactive. This is not just a kind of a, a hashtag thing. You know, we're doing... LGBT this, Black History Month, for just doing hashtags. They really are embedding the inclusion strategy. And the training they're doing goes beyond e-learning, tick boxing. They're truly engaged in their leaders and managers. And that's where the, that's where the conversation is starting. The CEO, the, the C-suite, the board are all engaged, not just the d &I team or the HR team. It always frustrates me when I hear d &I leaders having to present a case or strategy to the board. I also say, well, hang on a minute, the board produced the strategy. You are then enacted to go and deliver that strategy. So when people who are outside the board are being told to come up with a business case and the strategy, that really frustrates me because it means the board don't truly get it. So what really inspires me to answer the question is organizations where the, it really is driven from the top. The forward into the, the DNI playbook, the, the customer-facing, inclusive behaviours pamphlet you put out is all driven by the senior leadership. And they know their why. So it's not just a case of going, oh yeah, we do this. They can have a conversation around racism to a 10-year-old. They can have a conversation around male privilege. They can have a conversation around menopause. So they can have these conversations and it's really, really embedded, not just that performative tick box. So that's when I think it makes a difference. Organisations that truly embed it from the top down. Anybody else? Hearing none, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>